One of the great lies in aviation is that a second engine makes you safe. The last video I did covered the crash of a turbo Cessna 310 following a loss of engine power during takeoff out of Santa Fe. Through the process of research I discovered that there is a lot of confusion about the aerodynamics that affects a light twin with one engine inoperative. I'll cover the basics real quick. VMC is a minimum controllable airspeed in a twin. If you slow below this speed, rolling forces will exceed aileron authority. The interesting thing, from a pilot's perspective, is that a VMC spin looks an awful lot like a stall spin. A stall being the precipitous drop in lift as the angle of attack exceeds a critical limit generally brought on by a decrease in airspeed. A spin is caused by asymmetric lift that occurs when one wing stalls before the other due to uncoordinated flight. The response to a stall is always the same regardless of aircraft attitude. Reduce the angle of attack. This is an important concept, that aerodynamics don't change based upon aircraft attitude. The laws of physics don't care whether the aircraft is straight and level or inverted and pointing at the ground. You can stall a wing in any attitude, including inverted. In all cases, the way you break a stall is to apply down elevator. This leads us into the aerodynamics of an aircraft that's traveling crooked with a persistent yaw in a slip or a skid. There are a lot of things that happens to an aircraft that's flying sideways. Increased drag is one. Another is asymmetric lift. VMC, which stands for Velocity Minimum Control, is a minimum speed at which ailerons can counter rotational forces created by asymmetric thrust. If you slow below this speed, there is not enough airflow over the ailerons to overcome the rotational forces acting on the aircraft. You roll inverted and generally die. And you may be asking the question, why not make bigger ailerons? The answer is that aviation is one big give and take. Bigger ailerons would adversely affect various limit speeds unless you strengthen the aircraft structure, but strengthening the aircraft structure adds weight and expense and decreases performance. It's a reason why aircraft cannot survive accident forces, but black boxes can. In an aircraft with center-mounted thrust, an engine failure only reduces performance. If the engines are off-center line, wing-mounted for instance, there is a lever arm between the thrust vector and the center of mass. This results in rotation around the yaw axis. If you don't do anything about that rotation, it's going to cause the wing on the good engine to travel faster through the air than the wing on the opposite side, which will result in more lift on the operating side and less lift on the failed side. With enough total airflow over the ailerons, they can counter the rolling momentum, but as speed decreases, so does aileron authority. Eventually, you run out of aileron and the aircraft rolls uncontrollably. The obvious way to counter this is rudder, but there's no free lunch. As you apply rudder to prevent yaw, you generate another type of yaw. The rudder deflects air in order to counter the rotational force caused by asymmetric thrust, but it also applies an imbalanced sideways force on the aircraft. This causes the aircraft to crab into the slipstream. Flight controls are not as efficient when air flows over them at an angle. Aerodynamically speaking, it's as though the aileron has become smaller. The situation is compounded by the slipstream that the operable propeller produces over the operable side wing, which generates, again, asymmetric lift. VMC effects are not nearly as powerful on jet aircraft for this reason. Jets do not direct air across the wing in the same way that propellers do. Five degrees of bank with the ball half out of center is not a common technique with jet pilots, and where it is, generally, it reflects the tradition of prop jobs. The technique for asymmetric thrust in a prop is to bank five degrees into the good engine with the ball half out of center. What you're doing here is using less rudder to counteract the yaw tendency by taking some of the vertical component of lift and moving it into the horizontal plane. This reduces minimum controllable airspeed by orienting the aircraft more directly with the slipstream. There's a little trick here because the more bank you use, the less rudder you need, the lower VMC will be. However, the FAA limits manufacturers to 5 degrees of bank in order to avoid the requirement for highly abnormal flight attitudes to be maintained by an already stressed pilot in order to meet VMC requirements. And this is where a lot of the confusion comes in, I think, because even a small amount of rudder is going to cause the aircraft to fly sideways. If you don't use any rudder, the aircraft will yaw, producing rolling momentum, but if you use rudder to counter the yaw, it'll cause the aircraft, nevertheless, to fly sideways, making the ailerons less efficient. 
Five degrees of bank as a technique is mentioned in aircraft operating handbooks, multi-engine training manuals, and regulations governing aircraft certification. The thing about it is that bank actually has little to do with VMC. It's easy to get confused on this when confronted with training materials that state that a bank towards a good engine decreases VMC by up to three knots per degree, up to five degrees of bank. Manufacturer published VMC assumes, in most cases, that the aircraft is maintaining five degrees of bank into the good engine while flying a constant heading. What this means, if you do the math, is that flying a normal attitude of wings level to maintain heading increases VMC by up to 15 knots. The important thing to understand in this is that we're talking about constant heading. The adverse effect of VMC doesn't have to do with bank, it has to do with coordinated flight, namely that coordinated flight is undesirable with asymmetric thrust. If you go backwards with it, if you are maintaining 5 degrees of bank into the good engine, in order to fly a constant heading, you need to maintain persistent yaw, which is a ball half out of center. The effects on VMC have to do with rudder displacement, not bank. Now, Some training materials claim that a bank into the inoperative engine will cause the VMC speed to potentially be greater than what's published by the manufacturer. This would lead you to conclude that you should never turn into the inoperative engine following an engine failure. The fact of the matter is that as long as a ball is half out of center towards a good engine, you can turn any direction you want without meaningfully impacting VMC. Again, the thing that adversely affects VMC is the amount of sideways force that the rudder is producing on the aircraft in order to counter the yaw produced by asymmetric thrust. The way to reduce VMC is to reduce the yaw by as little as is reasonably possible. Ball half out of center towards a good engine. There are a few other oddities when talking about VMC. Like I said, the FAA limits bank angle to 5 degrees in order to maintain a constant heading, which again is required because the pilot is applying insufficient rudder to counter the yaw in order to increase the safety margin between VMC and single engine climb speed. The reason the FAA refers to a bank limitation is because it's universal. Five degrees of bank is identical for every single airframe. Rudder deflection to obtain that is different from airframe to airframe. A second oddity is that VMC is inversely dependent on weight. It's highest when the aircraft is lightest. That's the opposite from stall speed where speed increases in proportion to weight. The reason for this has to do with inertia. If you apply a constant force on an aircraft that weighs more, it's going to move less. The amount of rudder you need to keep the ball half out of center is dependent on the amount of thrust that an engine is producing, which is independent of weight. The same amount of force on a rudder in a heavier aircraft is going to produce less sideways movement, resulting in less disruption of airflow over the ailerons, resulting in a lower VMC, which produces a greater safety margin to single engine target speeds. And while the performance advantages of a turbo aircraft in a high density altitude environment, such as Santa Fe in July, are generally positive, the fact that the engines are producing more thrust has a negative effect on VMC. Again, asymmetric thrust is what creates the need for rudder deflection, which ultimately causes a VMC limitation. As it is, the quickest way to recover control when a multi-engine aircraft begins a VMC roll is to reduce power on the operative engine. This is one of the insidious things about a VMC roll. Decreasing pitch doesn't increase roll authority like it does in a stall. You must regain airspeed, which takes time, or limit thrust, which is more immediate, in order to recover from an insipid VMC roll. The other great difficulty in a VMC roll is that good stick and rudder pilots develop a native habit to deflect a rudder in the direction that the yoke is pointing. This is almost always the correct response, but in a VMC scenario, it's the exact opposite of what you should be doing. You're just adding rudder and exacerbating the sideways flight path which reduces aileron authority even further. There's really not much to do about this. You can't retrain the mind in the middle of a VMC event. You really just have to avoid that event in the first place. And if you encounter it, you have to reduce thrust even if you're at low altitude. If we drop back into the Santa Fe crash, the pilot was a sole occupant on board the six passenger Cessna 310. We don't know how much fuel he had, but reports are that he was flying to his home in Southern California, so probably a good fuel load. Without any other occupants, though, the aircraft had to be noticeably below max takeoff weight, which increases VMC. Turbo engines are better for overall performance at high-density altitudes, but the extra thrust they produce increases VMC as well. 
Given the lack of climb performance for the duration of the one minute flight, there is a possibility that the failed engine propeller, which appears to be the number one or the left engine, may not have been feathered in this particular case. This results in a higher VMC speed as well. The thing is, the published VMC of 80 knots for this aircraft assumes all of these conditions, lightweight, high thrust, and the failed propeller in a higher RPM setting. This last one is dependent on whether the aircraft has auto feather or not. The SESTA 310 does not, so takeoff pitch on the failed engine is assumed. It also assumes that aircraft's yaw is not totally countered by rudder forces, aka ball half out of center. This means that heading will drift towards a failed engine unless a bank into the good engine is maintained. VMC does not meaningfully change if you turn into the inoperative engine but your rate of turn will increase to what it had been if you had five degrees more bank when turning into the failed engine. Banked into the good engine, the rate of turn will be equal to five degrees less of bank, which is why five degrees of bank into the good engine equals a zero turn rate. In other words, from a performance standpoint, turns are more efficient into the failed engine because a yaw produced by the ball being half out of center is facilitating the turn. Truth is, VMC dynamics are at play any time the slipstream hits the aircraft at an angle. This can be due to a gust or other phenomenon. The vertical stabilizer exists largely to ensure that the aircraft does not maintain a crab angle through the slipstream for long. With an engine failure and a twin, the amount of rudder used to counter the asymmetric thrust will produce a persistent sideways angle through the air. The more the rudder, the greater the crab between the aircraft and the slipstream. This also reduces aircraft performance as drag is increased. Airplanes aren't very aerodynamic broadside. The VMC problem is twofold. The first is that when performance is marginal, which it is on any twin aircraft that encounters an engine failure, the natural tendency is to pitch up for a better climb rate. It takes a great deal of discipline to pitch the nose over at low altitude in order to maintain airspeed, but it's what you have to do, even if it means flying the aircraft into the ground. Survival is enhanced when the aircraft impacts terrain right side up. But this is a terribly difficult thing to do when your life is flashing before your eyes. The second dilemma is that good pilots learn to maintain aircraft coordination reflexively. In the event of slow flight, coordination can be the difference between surviving and spinning. Yet during a failure in a twin, you want to purposefully fly the aircraft uncoordinated. It feels unnatural. If you're a good stick and you lose focus for a moment, you'll kick the rudder to coordinate and increase VMC by a bundle. The best technique is to trim the rudder half out of center and plant your feet on the floor when you're distracted running checklists or talking to ATC. Now that's something that's easy to say sitting safely in my office, but practice makes perfect. And though I have a strong preference for Microsoft Flight Simulator for these recreations because the graphics are so immersive, I think that the flight physics of X-Plane are probably a little bit more realistic as it relates to ball half out of center flying. These desktop sims represent, by far, the best bang for the buck as it relates to flight training. It's revealing to take a normally aspirated twin to an airport with a 9,000 foot density altitude and pull the mixture 50 feet off the deck in a sim. The aircraft's gonna descend. There's nothing to be done about it other than to find the best scene for the crash. I did a run with the Cessna 310 out of Santa Fe. It's not the turbo version. They don't have that option on Microsoft Flight Simulator. It confirmed what we already know about the loss of engine and light twin at high density altitude, and that's that it's going to require a continuous descent in order to maintain a safe airspeed. Your power on glide ratio is better in a light twin than the glide ratio in a single that's suffering an engine failure, but an engine failure soon after liftoff doesn't allow for a return to the field in either circumstance. It's an old story in aviation whether there's really all that much advantage between a light twin and a high performance single. Although if you're primarily operating out of lower elevation airports, the twin will still get the job done if you're prepared. I also did the Santa Fe run with a turbo Cessna 414 and it didn't have much performance. It was a constant battle between maintaining airspeed and not giving up too much altitude. I was able to wrestle it back around for a landing. I can tell you that turning into the failed engine was a better option after I trimmed the rudder for ball half out of center. You get a better rate of turn with less bank. Hopefully this was useful or at least informative. I'm still working on the Helios hypoxia crash from 2004. I think I may do a booklet on it as well. If you'd like to support the channel and you like these videos, you probably like the booklets that I'm going to start doing. If you haven't picked the one up on the Judge Ryan Searish crash, click the link here or check in the video description to find it on Amazon.
Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.